and welcome to the ELT Under the Covers podcast. Today, our next guest is a freelance writer, teacher, trainer, consultant, specializing in digital publishing, online course development, and the development of digital resources for teachers. Since 1992, he's worked all over the world as a teacher, trainer, and project manager. He was the global head of learning for Macmillan's online English learning school, English Up, from 2014 to 2016. In 2016, he won his second British Council Award for Innovations and co-founded Peachy Publications Limited. Welcome to the show, the digital guru, Nick Peachy. Thanks very much. Thanks for that. I'm not sure about the digital guru. In, in a way, I kind of keep trying to throw that off a little bit, and kind of widen my, my spectrum of appeal. But, you know, it, it, it comes back at me. It's like a boomerang. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we live in a... a God, I can't believe I just started a phrase with we live in a world. We live in a world where it, it's becoming more and more relevant um, and more and more integrated within uh, education. So it, it's maybe yeah. not necessarily a bad thing. But before, yeah. before we kind of kind of get into that and maybe what you're doing now to to broaden broaden what you're doing, um, can we can we dial it back and go all the way back to the beginning of kind of like how you started getting into teaching and if you could give us your origin story well it all started in prison <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> it did, actually it did start in prison uh, i but I, I was uh, a music student and i studied music and um you know i did started getting into teaching just to sort of um, get through my degree and not have to borrow too much money and okay. and my next door neighbor worked did art therapy in a prison and she said they were looking for a guitar teacher in the prison so I thought, okay, you know, it was, you know, comparatively then really well paid. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll give that a try. So I went along to the prison once each week in the evening and did um, blues guitar classes for prisoners, for a group of prisoners. How was that? And that, that was extraordinary. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was extraordinary. Some interesting classroom management um, pr kind of problems and things <laughs> like that, <laughs> um, which which I'm not really supposed to speak speak about. I think I had, when I went in, I had to find, sign the Official Secrets Act oh, really? to say that I wouldn't sort of talk about what happened there. But you know, oh, okay, okay, but, like that. Fair but, enough, but fair you know, there there fine. there is a story that I have about students exchanging chocolate biscuits for drugs and you know in my class and that was a difficult thing to deal with you know but so sorry, uh, so sorry when was this nick what, this what, was back in I, I guess this was back in the early 1990s nice. early 1990s okay. um i was still in college then and you know and uh no. So, but it was an interesting experience and it, it, it kind of, it, it was interesting for a lot of reasons. It's interesting from the, sort of the development as a teacher because I'd never taught anything before. Mm -hmm. um, and it was quite interesting sort of from the perspective of the impact that education has on people and how you can see that. You know, in the you know, most of the guys who were who were in the prison were really no different from me or a lot of the other people that I knew. But you know, for some reason that they you know they they stood out a bit, and you know they had they'd sort of fallen into bad ways mainly because of lack of education, and you know, and that you really started to see that you know they weren't bad people or anything like that they were just people who had had a you know who had drawn a short stick really and uh, that had sort of quite an impact on me and i think that's that still sticks with me today i think it's, it's really i i hear this repeatedly and i i this there's um a certain line of there's a publisher i can't remember the name um but i believe one of their books actually got turned into a movie uh meg um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, but they, that book was actually wrote for, they write books for prisoners where, where basically they do graded readers for mm -hmm. adults uh, and for basically um, kind of young men, because the majority of prisoners, prisoners are, are, mm -hmm. are men, um, uh, with their interests in mind in order to, you know, raise their reading level and education level. And they, they I think it was... Uh, I can't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but it was a significant percentage of those people that had 
were able to raise their education on reading, but specifically reading level, um, greatly reduce their um, reoffend reoffending time. So yeah, I can I can believe yeah, you know sure. like what you were doing there would give them uh, maybe skills, yeah. but also confidence that they can they can yeah. learn basically. Yeah. As a, that, that might not have happened in my case because as a teacher, I wasn't a particularly good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really, you know, but it, it, it kind of, you know, you always feel that, oh, oh well, anybody who knows about something can teach. But, you know, it, one of the things that I learned from that is you really know, need to know how to teach. It's mm -hmm. not just, you know, I could play the guitar, but, you know, knowing how to teach the guitar is a very mm -hmm. different thing. It's like the same thing that we have in the English language field of, you know, being able to speak the language doesn't mean you can know, teach the language. Language. It's a very different thing. Well, I'll tell you what comes to mind there, Nick, is um, the sort of univer the university lecturers and professors and yeah. the way that many of them teach. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 we, we've talked about this before, and uh, there just does seem to be this idea that, you know, what you're paying for there is expertise, not necessarily pedagogy. Yeah. <laughs> there are some good yeah. ones, but... Yeah. They, they, they certainly seem to be the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. I mean, that was another interesting thing for me, actually, because I was a, I was actually a mature student. I, I kind of left school at 17 and ended up being a cleaner and doing odd jobs and building work and things like that. And at some point in my life, I thought, you know, I don't want to spend the rest of my life like this. And so I, I, I started playing the guitar and got, got back into college to do a, a kind of degree in music. And, and it, after that, you know, I wanted to do composition. And so I thought, well, I hadn't got any money. So I, I decided to become an ELT teacher, go to Japan and make some money to do my master's in comp composition. Oh. Pretty bizarre plan on reflection, you know, thinking that I'd make some money from ELT. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I went to do my CELTA course, you know, the, the teachers, my trainers, I thought, what, what fantastic. And it was, I felt it was amazing. And I thought, you know, this is why I've never felt that I could learn anything. You know, I didn't have teachers like these. You know, I've been used to sort of, you know, when I did my music foundation course, you know, the, the guy who lectured us would come in with his book of Groves music and his notes from the last 20 years and just kind of read bits of the book to us. And we were supposed to sort of make notes and, and then sort of know that stuff. And, you know, I always felt, well, you know, why don't you just give us the notes that are in your book that you're reading from? <laughs> and then yeah, we're done, aren't we? You know, but... So I, it was the first time I realised, you know, how bad some teaching could be, and uh, mm. and and what good teaching looked like as well. So that for me, that it made a huge impact on me. You know, I really enjoyed teaching, doing um, teaching English language students. I did my CELTA in Cairo. Um, I was working with refugees and um, there, and and it was just fantastic. And just sort of being with people, you know, especially after as a musician, you spent a lot of time alone practicing your scales and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. actually being with a group of people was kind of nice. It was, you know, it, it had that performance aspect as well, which was quite nice. So, and I really enjoyed it and got into it. And, uh, and I think probably the, the world hasn't missed, you know, one less jazz guitarist. So, you know, <laughs> that's probably the world, <laughs> a good decision. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't have imagined that, um, sort of a music style career would be the obvious path into ELT. However, I don't know if you know this, but when we spoke to Jamie Keddy, he said that yeah. he started as a pianist on a cruise ship. And then it was after injuring his hand that he got into <laughs> English teaching. Yeah. You, you'd be surprised how many people get into it who can, uh, who come from a performing arts background. Mm. You know, I, I found a lots of people who have been actors or have been writers or, you know, musicians and especially kind of the, the kind of native speaker ones like myself who knocked around the world a bit. You know, there were quite a few people like that who'd come from something else and... Uh, but, or, or who, and who are still doing something else as well. Because it is, you know, it is quite a nice profession to be in in that way. There is the performance aspect. It can be incredi incredibly creative. And, you know, you get to work with people and you get that kind of 
the, the kind of feedback of an audience in a way, you know, which is really nice too, and in a really nice way too. Well, it, it, so. it's a big component of it, um, and I think it's something that the more academic side of um, ELT don't really acknowledge as much um, because I guess it's a more of a soft skill, so you can't you can't teach it. But you know, like there's people out there that <laughs> don't don't uh, have any pedagogy, don't have any CELTA that just go to, you know, China or Vietnam or whatever country and just turn up in a classroom. But yet everyone mm. loves them because, you know, they can play the guitar and they're entertaining. These just, you know, the kids aren't <laughs> learning anything really. So, um, you know, there's definitely a component and the, te the teachers that do well um, tend to be those that can combine both. And uh, just yeah. on your point of a, a jazz, a, a jazz guitarist in the classroom, I'm like, I think that you know Scott Thornberry might argue that Dogme is basically ELT jazz. So <laughs> yeah, improvisation for sure. And, <laughs> yeah. and I, and I think you know there are parallels as well between learning music and learning language. Okay. Is in that you know you have form and structure, but and you improvise within that. You know you have kind of genres of of, of conversation, if you like. Yeah. You have genres of text for sure, and you know and you you still have to work within that within defined structures and improvise within that. You know conversation isn't you know isn't pre-scripted is it you know you have to work with the language that you have you're not just regurgitating chunks of language you're actually working creatively with them to sort of you know reinterpret meaning and uh, and negotiate meaning with people so i think you know the music side of it and the jazz side of it is i think very relevant how how do you see music i mean because for me I kind of put a lot of these, and this is my uh, fairy brain talking, um, I put a lot of these language, music, art under the umbrella of communication. Do you feel like when you're playing music that you are trying to communicate in a way or is it is it more kind of you are just being expressive? Well, that's kind of communication. I don't know. what. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I guess it's a mixture of both. You, in, in some ways, you're trying to communicate. In, in some ways, you know, it's communication with yourself as well. Mm. You know, I, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, you know, when I, I, I spend a lot of time playing on my own and alone, and for me, it's a kind of... Um, it's an escape. It's kind of a meditation. You know, you can, it, it consumes your mind and you can sort of mm. not think about anything else for a while. And that's mm. kind of nice. But performance in a way is more when you come to perform, it's sort of a lot about communication and, you know, kind of distilling that and conveying that, isn't it? You know, because if, if you listen to, to music, you know, you're looking for it to communicate to you, aren't you, really? Yeah. You no, know, you're looking for something that speaks to you. Yeah, be it actually with with the lyrics, with with mm -hmm. with intention from the music and the artist. Sometimes it's not with intention; it just speaks to you, and you know, just gets you dancing. And there's no mm -hmm. kind of it's just kind of fluff. Okay, so we we talked about um, your first getting started, and, and currently you're you're traveling the world. Um, you, you're going to all these different countries. Uh, teaching when did you kind of start to take it to the the next level um, per se um i guess um uh, my when my, i, I traveled moved around for through a few countries for five or six years i'd done my delta and i moved to barcelona mm -hmm. and um I started working at International House Barcelona and got into CELTA training there. At the time, I, I had to, when, when I first moved there, it's funny mentioning Scott Thornbury, um, I had to take over classes from Scott Thornbury. Oh, and I was God. like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I can do that. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to go and observe a couple of his classes and then take over the classes from him. And, um, you know, which was, in a way, was great. And it's great to be sort of knocking around a school where people like that were. You know, Scott Thornbury was there. Gavin Dudney, who's uh, sort of another technology guru, was there. Um, Graham Stanley was working there at the time, you know. Um, lots lots of people connected with ed educational technology and teacher training were there. And I managed to get into CELTA training there, which was which was kind of a good move and um 
I started doing my master's while I was there as well. I did a master's in educational technology through Manchester University. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of quite interesting because at the time, this was about uh, 97, I think, um, at the time, I knew nothing about technology and educational technology. I just bought a laptop and uh, had to get someone to help me connect it to the internet, oh, yeah. and which I think was Gavin Dudney, actually. And... Um, you know, and, uh, you know, decided to, um, some guy turned up to, who was one of the teacher trainers, said he was doing a master's in educational technology. And I thought, oh, that sounded really interesting. Don't know anything about that. I'll give it a try kind of thing. And, yeah. uh, and that's what I did and really enjoyed it. You know? that's, that's awesome. That's interesting. And <laughs> I, 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 this, this works with, this kind of relates to my background as well, because I, I did media production. Um, uh, university um so my question is how do you find you, you did your masters with educational technology did you find that useful now with the education we have now because i found that my degrees very fast very quickly became <laughs> not based on the technology i was used to at all yeah yeah i think it's you know i did my masters through um distance learning and it took me five years, four or five years, I think, to complete it. Mm -hmm. And the technology within that space of time changed pretty rapidly. Wow. You know, I'd, I'd just finished my Delta, which I'd done distance <clears throat> as well. And I'd done that. They'd posted these, they used to post these yellow packs of photocopied books to you each yeah. month. And you, you'd then fax in your uh, assignment kind oh, of thing. I fa was faxing in my assignments from Singapore. And then you go to this sort of master's uh, degree and, you know, I'm, you know, we had an online community and stuff like that but uh, like you say the technology was moving pretty quickly and you know it was kind of in those days it was pre-flash and we were learning how to do html code to code a page you know yeah. writing every single letter of the code out by hand and, yeah. and stuff like that but i think you know the good thing about doing it distance and doing it over a longer period of time is that you develop as an autonomous learner mm -hmm. you know and i think that's you know, for me, that was what I really got from it, this ability to learn autonomously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the thing that sort of helped me develop my career because, you know, if I just stopped learning about technology when I finished my master's, I would be totally irrelevant now, you know, because most of that stuff is just, it's just mm -hmm. history, you know. I, you know, but by the end of, I think by the time I finished my my MA, you know, you could just about, you know, watch a live streamed video and it was, it would be about this big on your screen. And, you know, I can remember the, fir the, the first video I watched that, that was live streamed, it was Beyonce, it was a Beyonce music video. And it was just so blurred, you're kind of thinking, is that Beyonce over there? Or is that Beyonce? <laughs> no, 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 that's the curtains. That's Beyonce. You know, you could just about distinguish it. But so things are coming, you know, being able to do things like this is, is huge. And that's, that's sort of come about over such a short amount of time. It's just, you know, mind boggling. It's, it's mind boggling. And it's mind boggling that it's not, it's not like it's stopped now, you know, it kind of feels mm. like um, everyone's saying, well, it, this is, this, we're, we're at the peak and we are at the peak, but we're on, we're at the peak riding a giant wave. And we just, looking back, you kind of go, this is crazy how fast this has changed. And then you've got to extrapolate from that and pu push it forward and go, well, what's it going to be next? But I kind of want to, I want to return back to um, your story before we dive into something more like that. Um, so you've, you've done your master's, um, you've... Uh, you've got all these uh qualifications you're, you're feeling more of an autonomous learner uh, what what's happening now at this point is this when you start to get into peachy publications or um not at that point no i started uh, I, I started getting you you know i started getting pulled out of teaching and more into project management oh. i got a job in 2003 working for the british council do, managing the british council's teaching english website which it then was just starting up so i started sort of managing that and getting into sort of teacher development through technology and things like that so i did that for about 4 years 
and learned an awful lot from that. And then about 2007, you know, I decided to sort of go freelance and, and go into freelance educational technology, doing training. And I was blogging then and a and, um, bit of materials writing and stuff like that. Okay. And that was a that was kind of a, a a big step, and you know, going from the security of a job with a civil service pension to sort of going freelance, and uh, and um, you know, also you know, as the the manager of the within the British Council, you know, you, you I was sort of flying around to conferences all over the world, you know, presenting the website at the time and trying to get people on board for it and and stuff like that. And so, you know, you're met there and you're the guy from the British Council. So it's like, oh, yeah, you, you feel like this VIP and you're treated well, really you're, nicely. You're, you're not just the guy from British Council. You're the manager of the website that's you know, yeah, like, yeah. Silly, it's becoming more and more and more relevant every year. And um, so, yeah. so um, what what drugs did you take to make you take with that? <laughs> I I don't know. You know, I felt like I was so, sort of stuck in a rut of doing the same things. Okay. And you know, I applied for something, you know, uh, which would have been a step up and didn't get it. And sort of felt, well, you know, if I really want to move on, you know, I have to start doing it for myself. And you know, mm. I saw, you know, we were hiring in these consultants to to sort of, you know, tell us stuff about technology you know, that I already knew. And I thought, oh, I could be one of those guys, you know. Right. So uh, so I decided to, to sort of leave and go into consultancy work and um, things like that, which has been great. It's had its ups and downs and, you know, and, and scary moments. And there's moments when I've kind of, they've gotten so scary where I had to get a job and again, and, and then I've gone back to being freelance again. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting route, that's for sure. Um, but you're you're liking it right now. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I still have my worrying months when you know you, you you're cruising along, you've got too much work, you know, you, you and all of a sudden the work comes to an end, and you think, oh, I've got nothing. <laughs> you know, I better go and find some work again. Yeah. You know, write some more books or something like that. I mean, the the peachy publication side of it and the writing, you know, my own books and publishing them mm -hmm. really helps a lot with that because you know that that that's a bit of a cushion for when you know when you come up to that gap where you've you've suddenly got no work you know i, I can always always put work into that and do write some more books write some more lesson plans mm -hmm. and although that doesn't pay off immediately you know in the long run those things bring money back and mm -hmm. and so that's a, a kind of good thing really to it's, it, it seems like you're really into infographics at the moment yeah, I've been into infographics for quite a while. Infographics have been my one of my sort of you know pet loves. It's just you know it's a, it's a really nice form of of media that's very um, user friendly for the computer screen. You know, it's much more it's much easier to get, especially language students who who don't have high language levels. It's easier to get them reading reading through an infographic that has sort of lots of visual support vocabulary rich information rich than it is to get them you know reading a black and white text off the screen or something like that so i, I find them really useful for that yeah. it, it makes sense uh, you know we're, we're so visual and it, it, it I, I don't know it it helps process and there's generally there seems to be like a, a thing with humans where we we like it in a, a visual form i i've just been researching about richard feynman uh, with his Feynman diagrams and stuff, mm -hmm. and it, you know that revolutionised physics, right? So, you know, maybe mm -hmm. infographics will. I, I wonder how they will be used within the classroom. Maybe just for homework. I don't know. It, I, re I really, I, I, I like how they can stimulate conversation because I've yeah. actually, I've actually used a few of Nick's infographics. In fact, um, I was using one today um, about the. Oh God. <laughs> you know when you can't remember something you did five yeah it's had a big impact on you hasn't it oh, <laughs> no, but it'll come yeah. it was the habits of billionaires it was the 10 uh, habits yeah, yeah. of billionaires yeah. and um, you know I, I don't think it's it's not like presenting this stuff and saying you know well this is all well researched and it's definitely true it's more like mm -hmm. hey what do you think about this you know do you think this yeah. is true and 
stuff like yeah. that. Like. Yeah, I think it, it's always, you know, I, I think it's one of the things that is a theme through my work is, you know, provoking uh, students' uh, opinions about stuff. It's not a, a point of, you know, giving them a text or giving them something and saying, do you understand it? You know, it should be a point of giving them a text or something. And do you agree with it? You know, do you believe it? Mm. You know, what what do you make of that? And so that there's a much more personal response. I think too much of, of the ELT materials were designed with comprehension of what we believe are the key facts or the key ideas rather than, you know, what what how it matches into the student's life, what they're going to do with it, you know, what they feel about it, what they think about it. You know, and that's where really lear- learning takes place is when you start, you know, pulling it into your life and thinking, what am I going to do about this? You know? mm-hmm. So how, how do you go about um, creating a, a, and finding these, these, these uh, you know, packets of information or, or what have you? What, what, you know, what kind of, what do you look for when you're about to create these infographics or, you know, your lessons and what have you? Um, for the infographics, I generally find them online, and you know it, it might be sort of a, a theme that's uh, that's kind of popular at the time. Like NFTs are is it NFTs? Yeah, NFTs are a big th- thing at the moment, aren't they? Yeah. Non fungible. To- um, totally. I can't remember what non, the T is. Tokens. That's- that's right. So I thought, oh, I'll have to have a look at for an infographic about it. And I found a few infographics about that and started writing a lesson plan about it, oh. you know, because that's something that's sort of quite thematic. Sometimes I just find them and think, wow, that's really useful information or that's really interesting and, and uh, start building a lesson that way. Um, with some of the, I, I, I do, I've, I'm writing a course called Conversation and Listening, which, which started off as a, uh, as a kind of as, as materials for English speaking class and to get people speaking. And for those, you know, I actually write scripts and commission audios for them. And for those, you know, rather than sort of setting out to get students to understand them, I, I try to sort of develop comprehension activities that get students to compare their lives with the person that they're listening to. So that they're kind of looking for some element of common ground. What where's the commonality with this person? How does their experience match onto my experience? That kind of thing. And uh, mm. you know, because I think that's you know, that's where where learning take like, takes place is is sort of having an emotional connection with something. Yeah, I, I would I would definitely agree with that. Um, there's or that. Yeah. No. In a way, it's a bit like the music, isn't it? As well, you know, if you if you listen to the music and you have no emotional connection to it, it, it just doesn't stick it, with it you. It needs does to it? resonate. Yeah. It needs to resonate. And there are yeah. there are deeper, more universal themes that you know, if someone in America or you know in Korea makes music, you know, it might it might be in a different language, but you know, the the sounds, yeah. the the melody might connect with you uh, and everyone else can feel that sadness or that happiness or what have you. Yeah. I think what's a little bit ironic, I suppose, about the importance of interest and engagement in the classroom is I don't think I've actually come across anyone recently anyway who doesn't admit that, who doesn't say, you know, if someone's going to learn, so if you if you want a class to go well and someone to learn something well and easily and all the rest of it, like interest is the paramount thing. It's the most important yeah. thing. And non, nonetheless, this message does not seem to transmit <laughs> into the mainstream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody says yes. Yeah, it's, it's about interest. It's about engagement. It's about. But what's the grammar point? Yeah, what's the grammar point? <laughs> <laughs> How many vocabulary words are gonna they're gonna learn? I've had a real problem with this actually in terms of uh, you know trying to sell the materials because you know at point some points I've talked to you know schools or people who are running courses and you know wanting them to sort of take the materials and use it as a course you know and and often that's what they say where's the 
the grammar syllabus and or you know how many vocabulary words are they going to learn what's the vocabulary they're going to learn from this and you know I've tried to write the material so that they're very student-centered and so well the vocabulary they're going to learn is whatever they need in the lesson or whatever they come up with between themselves or mm. you know and the you know a similar thing from the grammar as well but that's you know it's a very hard thing to sell because you know we're so used to, you know, going to that that contents list and, well, yeah, go, okay, today we're doing the present perfect, let's go, you know. So why why do you think that is? I mean, um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of my thoughts first and let's see what chimes. But one of my thoughts were always with institutions, specifically well, academies that I'm thinking of more business-wise, they focus on the... Um, the materials more because I feel like they don't trust the skill of the teachers in a way like they you know they just see teachers especially you know like in language academies um, that are businesses they don't they know the teachers are going to come they're going to come and go you know maybe every year or whatever so as long as the material is good they know they can present that to the parents um, or, or whoever and say this is what you're going to be learning so it's almost kind of like the teacher's not really needed or they're just kind of there to kind of just facilitate it, like they're added on. So it's they're not the teacher isn't of importance when you kind of need a skilled teacher to be able to make it student centered. Yeah. I mean that that's kind yeah. of my thoughts, but you know, why 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 yeah. do you kind of I mean... across it? I think I think there are there are different elements and, and, and it is to some extent, you know, it it is the lack of appreciation of the teacher to some extent. Also, a lot of the schools that I've worked in, you know, it's about marketing. And so, mm. you know, and the marketing department doesn't really understand what goes on in the classroom. Mm. So what they see as marketable is, well, we're marketing this certificate or we're marketing, you know, this chunk of language that this yeah. person will learn. Mm. They don't really understand that actually the product, you know, what, what your students are paying for isn't the certificate, it's actually the teacher and the, the time spent with the teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think this was really, you know, I used to work for an, on, I worked for an online school for a couple of years as head of learning. And, you know, what we found was, um, you know, what students really valued most when we did all our sort of market research about, you know, we, we gave them their, their course materials, we gave them their autonomous course materials, but what they really wanted was time with the teacher. You know, that's what they valued and that's what they perceived themselves as paying for. And yet it's very hard, it seems very difficult for sort of the marketing departments in a lot of schools to understand that and appreciate that, that, that you know, really that's that's what the i mean it, it sounds horrible to say that the teacher is the product but time with the teacher is the product yeah. you know that's what students really perceive themselves as buying you but know, then, then the, how, do, how do we argue that it should be more student centered shouldn't it then be more teacher centered if they're paying for to be <laughs> well, with a teacher because <laughs> that teacher that yeah, person you know I mean? is the person like... who's able to understand what you need you know right it's like you know going to the doctor if you go to the doctor you know it's about you know the doctor talking to you and, and giving you what you need it's not about the medicine because you get that of the chemist you know mm. the, the, it's the knowledge of the doctor i think mm. uh, and i think you know the other big problem is 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 actually testing and assessment and certificates you know is that you know a lot of the, the teaching ends up having to and course book writing has to be go geared towards a, a sort of specific course because there's this certificate at the end and they're being assessed for this you know and that's that's a huge big money business and so you know mm. course books tend to be geared towards that we'll yeah. get you through IELTS or we'll get you through <clears throat> FCE or something like that yeah mm. I could I could teach kids or uh, and, and you know an, an okay amount or I could teach to test I could teach to you know pass IELTS or Cambridge first certificate and and make a little bit more bank so uh, yeah what, what's best for the the the, st the learner uh, i'm just gonna leave that hanging well at the end of the day i mean we do live in a world where you did it you did it we live in a world these certificates are <laughs> indeed you know this these certificates are mm. 
necessary for many students, aren't they? Particularly things like IELTS and Cambridge English, if, yeah. particularly if they want to study abroad or whatever. And that that's not going to change anytime soon, as we can talk about yeah. the pros no, we, and cons. We, we, we like to put people in exams, boxes, but... and then we bury them. I, I would change the word necessary for required, though. They're required by students. <laughs> students are required to have them, you know, like even to the extent where, to some extent, you know, they would prefer to acquire that that certificate by some method than actually do the put the work into actually learning the language and being able to speak the language. You know, what they need is to speak the language, but what they're required to, to produce is the certificate, isn't it? So, yeah, no, and that's... they don't always go in tandem. No, they don't at all. No. Not at all. And it, it, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a point now that's, I, I think with autonomous learning becoming more and more prevalent, the um accreditation it, it is important because it's it's like the shorthand uh that tells the employer that you're skilled because right now there's a lot of people going out there saying that they're experts in you know such and such and there's no real kind of way to prove that you're an expert in for example being a social media manager apart from being able to produce statistics but even those statistics can be skewed or might not be a good representation of how skilled that you are, i.e. Yeah. kind of like doing the IELTS or something like that, uh, is almost just a rough approximation. So I, I wonder how online schools are going to uh, deal with that going forward. Well, I, I think, you know, there's a big sort of issue around, you know, capability and links to certification and things like that generally throughout you know education as technology starts to move so quickly and technology impacts on everybody's job yeah. you know so increasingly your degree or your your certificate or whatever it is and whatever it's in you know the older it is the less valid it is unless Very you true. can you know what unless you can prove that you're somebody who's able to keep up and maybe, you know, somebody who hasn't got that degree increasingly is becoming more employable if they have, can show that they have the skills, if they're doing what's necessary and can sort of think and work independently to produce that. Those are the kind of people that a lot of employers are looking for now, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's... I would, to I would totally agree with that. Um, and, yeah, I think there'll be there'll be a lot of uh, circling round to kind of see how we can kind of update the education system to mm -hmm. be, I don't know, more fast paced, able to assess someone's skills more, uh, quicker in order to kind of show some certification or accreditation to make it yeah. easier for employers. I, I mean, um, how have you found it? Because you, where you, you first started doing this, you know, we were talking about, you know, HTML coding, you know, bit by bit and a little live stream of Beyonce. And now it's now it's everywhere and it's so ingrained. And suddenly uh, with the pandemic, everyone was forced into it. From your perspective, how, how was that, you know, for kind of teachers and, and yourself? Um, for myself, it, it, it's been, you know, on a kind of purely personal and selfish level, it's been quite good, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, th these are things that I've been doing for quite a while. And it, it's really great, you know, I mean, the pandemic, don't get me wrong, the pandemic is an awful thing. And it's, you know, it, it, if, but if there's one good thing that's come out of it, it's the sort of push within education to get teachers engaging with, and students engaging with technology, mm -hmm. you know. And what I've seen as well is, you know, some, especially among younger teachers, there's been a real kind of development of, uh, of engagement with technology and entrepreneurship from, from younger teachers. You know, loads mm -hmm. of teachers now producing their, their TikTok and Instagram lessons and things like that, which is marvellous, you know, it's just fantastic. And really using social media effectively, becoming, you know, independent uh, producers of media. And, and I think, you know, the range of what's available to the students now through different social media and through technologies is much wider and, and and i think that's really good a really good thing yeah we, we talked with um teacher little mary um 
uh, who's a, a, a YouTube teacher uh, a couple of a month or so ago and mm. um, you know, she's doing exactly what you you were talking you know she's she's currently taking her master's in technology and um, uh, and language learning but also teaching online but you know whereas you have your books she focuses on social media on youtube to kind of supplement uh, mm -hmm. her income and it's it kind of seems like a lot of uh, tools have been put into teachers hands for ways to kind of move away from institutions in a way and kind of become more self-employed in a way yeah yeah and for I, I saw recently there's a nice site set up as a teacher collective and a, a cooperative as well you know teachers getting together to sort of form their own businesses and um, you know i think that's called my cool class i think um just to give them a push and uh, you know which i think is a really good thing you know teacher cooperatives is a great idea i think you know because it is difficult to do everything on your own you know yeah. if you've got to if you've got to teach you've got to be the marketing person you've got to make sure the money comes in you've got to make sure the bills get paid you know and the, the invoices get sent out it's it's a lot to, to deal with but mm. so you know the idea of sort of teach cooperatives i think is a really nice idea and you know teachers working together to sort of uh, um, achieve things is great yeah uh, so i mean it's been a a lot easier for the more the let's just say the younger more digital native teachers but then we've got older generation maybe not so digitally savvy teachers uh, colliding with this new uh, education technology being you know online and blah 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 blah, blah. but um what what have your experiences been with um those teachers you know what, what uh, do you have them coming to you going what, what do i do what do i do <laughs> yeah i mean what, what i mean one of the things that's come up to out of it for me is a lot of training work and and things like that which is which is nice but you know i think you know a lot of old te older teachers have been pushed to do to sort of engage with it and you know in some cases people you know if they're really willing to and they're still open-minded enough you know can engage with the technology and can see how to use it and are willing to do that i mean i know there are lots of people who long for the classroom and and for whom this isn't human for them and and stuff like that and those probably probably those people will start going back to the classroom quite rapidly the, the but, you know, whatever, even when they do, I think they'll take something valuable from this experience with them. You know, I think it's, you know, teaching online is a really valuable experience. It's, it's valuable to see yourself and how you communicate because, you know, most teachers standing around in the classroom can't see themselves. But, you know, I'm here now in Zoom and I can see myself. And, you know, actually when I, I teach and I do my sessions, I, I kind of teach standing up so I can and get a bit further back so I can sort of, because I use my hands a lot and so, so yeah. I do it like that but I, I'm in a chair for this uh, uh, today because I'm I'm trying out a new desk but um but I think it, it's good to see yourself and see what your body language is like and see how well you're communicating it's good to have you know the chat that kind of back channel that goes on in your classroom anyway when teaching mm. when students are passing each other's notes other notes and sort of yeah. see how you can use that i mean most people most teachers have had a go with a few digital tools and they'll probably take something of that back to the physical classroom mm. with them. so you know i think you know there are very few losers in this in terms of education at, at least you know again I, you know the pandemic's a, a terrible thing but in terms of education i, I think there are a few few losers in some cases i think think the losers probably would be the students who have had to endure um, the, the teachers while they learn how to use the technology or those mm. that haven't got access to it, which is, you know, the really big issue, I think. And that's true yeah. that it's, uh, I'm not even sure, it, yeah, maybe we could say that it's a wealth gap. It's definitely a technology gap with, uh, because we, we always, I mean, we've mm. been talking about um teachers maybe certain teachers be not very tech savvy but then you know there's the the students side of it as well especially with the young learners where mm. 
you know if they don't have a parent around and they they don't they don't know as well that it's, it's going to be incredibly difficult for them so there's yeah. there, there's there's barriers with it as well yes yeah, definitely yeah yeah and of course there are you know in in some parts of the world you know the a whole family's internet access might come through one phone you know so mm. you know who's going to be using the phone at this particular time or you know can you de- borrow your father's phone so that you can have your lesson kind of thing you know um it, it, it can be very difficult and you know we have to think about sort of designing learning with those contexts in mind too you know and some of the projects that I, I work in work on or have worked on have been sort of you know engaging with in that those kind of scenarios as well yeah it, it's interesting as well because I always one of the things that Rich and I um, try to focus on and bring with uh, with our channel our podcast is that um the English language uh, teaching, the the industry and the pedagogy and all, all the methodology that we we have, um, we we're in a unique position because we don't just you know teach within our native country, but we teach in different countries with whole different levels of access to education and and means means as well. So you know like uh, you know we might be teaching in a, a university in the uk where we've got access to everything but then suddenly we're in a, you know like a, a rural village in china where we've just got a chalkboard so we've there's a whole array of skills uh, uh, that i'm sure that you found as you're traveling around where you kind of go <clears throat> you, you you're adaptive you're dynamic to be able to flip from high technology to low technology and i think there's a lot that our industry can bring to the broader education um but yeah just broader education you know what do you kind of see the elt industry to to be able to help not just with you know like teaching english but education as a whole is uh, yeah. yeah i mean i think there are things to be learned and and uh, from from english language teaching particularly from communicative methodology and and you know i think in, in a lot of ways english language teachers were kind of ahead of the curve in 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 terms of methodology and pedagogy in terms of sort of communicative language teaching and getting students to engage and and things like that although you know if you're a lecturer who lecturer who just stands there and talks then this kind of medium is kind of quite easy for you, isn't it? You know, it, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, it was much more challenging for some people who were used to sort of saying, or well, get into pairs and do this or getting into groups and do this, you know, that, that became much more difficult. But I think, you know, certainly for me, because a lot of the work I do nowadays is outside of English language teaching. It's, you know, it's also soft skills. It could be about finance, business, lots of different things. And, you know, what I've taken from, you know, what I've learned and the methodology that I've had through English language teaching has been really, really valuable, I think, and, and enabled me to teach those or design materials for those other fields in a much better way. So is that basically you are you're focusing on making it more student centered with the the materials and stuff that you produce outside of the yeah other. i think more student centered and more more student to student interactions and things mm-hmm. like that rather than you know the, this kind of lecture centric kind of approach that a lot of topics have mm. what do you have any thoughts about autonomous learning kind of how to teach that because you know you you developed it your you you developed autonomous learning yourself um the when you're trying to uh espouse that or you kind of get other students to do that because you know you could go online and you could look look at all these moogs or uh youtube and listen to lectures but then you still have to learn how when people come to you what do you say about the best way to go about doing that well, I've, I've done quite a lot of work with teachers on, on or teach, autonomous teacher development yeah. and sort of encouraging teachers to, you know, get involved in social media, getting involved in teacher communities. Mm. And, you know, I have a kind of 
uh, a session that I do, which shows a kind of cycle of, of how I do it myself. You know, you get embedded in a community, you ask questions, you find articles, you find the right people to follow, you read articles, you curate them and organize them. Maybe you blog about what you do so that there's some reflection on what you're reading. You try it out in the classroom and you, you write about it and get feedback. It's a, it becomes a kind of continuous loop. I think within sort of social media of this sort of finding information, processing it, seeing how you can apply it, reflecting on it, sharing it with other people, getting comments on it. You know, you're, I, I find that's what I find. I'm in this continuous kind of feedback and experimentation loop of, of you know, no, of learning. I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. You've put a lot of things into words there that I've been, I've been thinking about lately. Yeah. Uh, it definitely there's a lot of learning comes from community and that community almost acts as kind of like the teacher component mm -hmm. in yeah. where you could where you could ask questions and get guidance that's right yeah and do, you know and putting pushing that into the kind of materials that you that you produce for students you know getting them to involve get involved in communities and do research to check information and and then produce something based on what they've discovered and and share that you you can sort of push them to do the same kinds of things mm. you know project you know project work for example if you're taking a pbl approach project based learning approach then you know that's developing a lot of those kind of autonomous learning skills and i think that's really valuable mm. Yeah. Mm. interesting did you have anything to add rich <laughs> Well, there's, there's quite a lot of things actually that we could that we could sort of go into. Um, I I think that one of the big one of the big things is <clears throat> is reflection and thinking about all of these different things and how they fit together, and encouraging teachers to do that and providing an environment where teachers are able to do that, because we do have a lot of things that are seemingly contradictory, don't we? Like we want to build up student autonomy but we recognize the value of a teacher. <laughs> um, and I, th I think it when you said that, actually, when you spoke about the value of a teacher, it made me think about, there was a time about 15 years ago when I really got into MOOCs, you know, online <laughs> courses. And this website called Coursera had just started, started up. And there was a load of really interesting courses on there. And I think the website's still going, but it's a little bit different to the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. It's kind of saturated with courses now, but back then there was just, there, there, there weren't too many. And a lot of them were very interesting. They were from very kind of big institutions. So I did a, a whole load of different courses on a variety of topics because, you know, I find everything sort of interesting. So I did like this course on um, astrobiology and the search for life on other planets. It was very interesting by a, a professor from um, Edinburgh University. And I did this course on an introduction to programming. And it wasn't just about, you know, Java or whatever. It was a whole range of different programming languages. So I found that interesting. And Brief History of Humankind, which later was made into famous book, Sapiens, um, which came out. And, you know, I think pretty much everyone's heard of that and or read it now. Um, and I did the MOOC about 15 years ago. Um, with, uh, what's the fellow's name? Juval Noah. No. I always forget his name. Harari. He's a, <laughs> yeah. He's a, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, a whole load of different topics, all of them interesting to me. And I did all these different courses. And what I found was that the most critical element in determining how much effort I put in to that course and also whether it stuck with me was the lecturer. It mm -hmm. wasn't the subject. So yeah. some of the lecturers were really engaging. There's a fellow called Dan O'Reilly, and he did a course called Irrational Behavior. And he was using a lot of the kind of pedagogical techniques we use in ELT. Like before he would do one of his little mini videos on something, he would say, oh, so we did this experiment where we had this and we had this. What do you think happened? Who do you think who do you think, for example, hmm. earned more money or who do you think was more successful? You know, and then this pop up box would box would come up and you had to type what you thought and then do and then the video would continue. Right. And that kind of stuff was great. You know, it was it was obviously 
that he was driving this kind of interactive pedagogy and he was a very kind of interesting and dynamic lecturer in general. And that really highlighted to me the importance of the educator. And I think that language teaching, especially in the kind of 90s as, as communicative language teaching sort of all come together, the, the 80s, the 90s, the CELTA and everything. I think there was a big shift away from that as we kind of went, right, it's going to be all student centric and let's get rid of TTT and, you know, the teacher should be sort of almost squirreled away in a corner while everything happens in the classroom. It was almost like the ultimate aim there was to take the teacher out of the equation as much as possible. I remember with, they even structured it like that, that, okay, you might start off with teacher to students type interaction, but at the end you want it to be students to students, right? And, um, and I think it was, it, to me, it was almost like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And when I did my CELTA, I didn't really recognize that. I was just being told these things like, no, you know, avoid TTT and you want to make it really student centric and all the rest of it. And um, something about it felt off, but I couldn't, I didn't have the experience to be able to verbalize that or, or challenge it. But I think today I would challenge it. And I would say there's definitely a, um, there's more of a balance to be had there. We need to recognize the importance of what the teacher can bring. I think it's yeah. really important. <clears throat> yeah, I think it is. And it, it, it's kind of an interesting one to to think of, of what exactly that is, because it isn't just um, knowledge. You know, it's not just about the teacher's knowledge. It's also about, you know, oh, sorry. It's also about the the way that the, the kind of teacher can motivate you and make you feel, you know, it's your relationship with the teacher. And it is kind of interesting when when we think, because there's a lot of talk now, now about robot teachers and, you know, and, and how robots can facially, um, they can facially uh, um, or artificially create what what looks like a face being sympathetic or something like that, and and sort of they can simulate empathy if you like, mm -hmm. and I and I kind of wonder whether that will have the same impact on the student if they know that isn't a real person. Can you can you you know if if your robot is programmed to feel empathy for you, will you still feel motivated by that? No, or does it? Do you have to know that it's a real person what, in order to would, have would that be, relationship? Would we even need a robot? Would it be more like a, a virtual avatar? And then mm -hmm. would we even know if it's a virtual avatar? You know, like yeah, because we 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 deal with chatbots right now, and you know, a lot of the times, you know, you you know a lot of the times that it's a chatbot, but sometimes when they pop up and they just start talking at you, you're like, oh, you, there's two clicks sometimes of you going oh wait this is not a real person and then you, yeah. they, but they, they you switch off right um it, it's interesting and i think there's a, a a deeper conversation there as to how it's going to look in the future for teachers but um i think we're, we're, we're looking to wrap up now right is you, yeah you've got, I you've got to be somewhere I'll have to I'll have to leave in a few minutes to pick up my daughter from school. Okay, so um, from that very traditional school that hasn't changed in hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of years. Do you, do you do you ever go into the school and or go to parents' evenings and you just go ah uh, just just keep it together, Nick? Just keep no. it together. <laughs> when I walk into school, I'm just some old man with a beard and a hat on who's coming to pick up a little girl, and that's that's as much as they know, and that's fine. So. A little. Do they know? Don't sort of <laughs> burst into a nearby classroom. Well, what I, are you doing? <laughs> you know, I, I have, uh, uh, particularly for primary school, you know, I, I feel that, you know, I have very low ex expectations of what I want from them. You know, I want my daughter to go there, be happy, and enjoy her time learning. Mm, yeah. You know, I think if that's happening, then probably the rest is going to come. You know, okay, she's she in a way she has a privileged background in in that both her parents are educationalists and there are God knows how many digital devices knocking around in her house. But you know, but you know, if she goes there, she's happy and she enjoys learning. Then you know, I'm happy too. That's good. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't want to interfere with that. I think that's really what we can basically do uh, as teachers. Uh, 
um, and it's what I found when I, I was teaching in China was the thing that I could, I might not be able to get them to, you know, speak English fluently with my one class every two weeks, but I could get them to really enjoy my class and love learning. And if they, they can yeah. take away that from school, then, you know, they will be autonomous later on in life. That, that would yeah. be my hope. So Nick, could, could you uh, let our viewers, our listeners know how to get in touch with you, what you're working on now? And um, we'll, we'll put all of this below in the comments in the description, but uh, yeah. give us a rundown, please. I guess, you know, my main project at the moment is PG Publications, where I produce the materials that, you know, follow on from my values and my philosophy of education, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, they can get that within a, what's called a teacher's classroom app, which contains the whole library of materials if they want to, or they can buy individual ones. That's sort of my main project. I still, I'm still on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and Facebook and things like that. So I share things there with the community that I think will be useful. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I guess the, I sort of also curate materials and articles through Scoop It. I've got a, a website called uh, Tools for Teachers and Learners where I've curated about, I think about 1500 tools over the last 10 or 12 years wow. and and a similar one for for articles where there's, there's where i've been collecting articles that i find interesting connected connected with education and technology and and you know i'll, I'll give you links to share for those as well so but you know keep i just sort of focus on keeping learning and trying to keep things moving forward and uh, paying the mortgage when I can. <laughs> yeah, I, I would I would personally recommend Nick's um, LinkedIn feed. I think it's at the very least thought thought provoking, if not uh, has the occasional teaching gem in there. So yeah, yeah. check out Definitely the ones, comments it's, it's and the fun. description for the video and for this uh, audio podcast. And you'll, you'll be able to get all the links to what he's just mentioned. Um, but uh, big thanks to coming on the show, Nick. It, it's been Thank a really you. interesting Thank conversation, and um, it, you know, we, we love your work. Great, thanks. thanks. It's always always nice to have a chat with people. <laughs> yeah, and get it to is. do that. Very this often. day and age, it's especially <laughs> so. Yeah, it's me and a seven-year-old most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Bye bye. Thanks. If you're looking for more information uh, from myself, uh, you can go to teamteacherchina.com. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of materials, PowerPoints that you can use instantly in the classroom. We've got a Team Teacher China YouTube channel where we have videos teaching you how to use those uh, materials. Team Teacher English where we put those materials into a, a video form for self-study. And Team Teacher Baby where I take my experience as a teacher and put that into parenting. And go to YouTube comments with Professor Rich to see some English teaching you can catch me weekly live streams on oxford online english youtube channel oh and also you can you can do a youtube search for pog space uk and you would get my alpha version of my new gaming channel which actually just have some trial content on there at the moment you can email us here at elt under the covers of gmail.com if you have anything you'd like to contribute to the show smash that like button share and subscribe and, and watch 100 of the video and don't exactly. click off thank you <laughs> bye